All right, as the children move out, let us go to our... regular text from 2nd Corinthians. Today we will focus on 2nd Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7 to 18 and the title is Treasure in Jars of Clay. Last week we talked about preaching the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and that gospel is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God which is shown in our hearts. The God who said, let there be light and the light came into existence and vanished the darkness in the same way. Though our hearts were darkened, God sent the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in our hearts and therefore we sign forth that knowledge we preach this gospel because we are filled with this glory of the knowledge of God and it is shining out of our life. Whether we actively participate in preaching the gospel or not, we become the letters of Christ, we become the mirror from which the glory of God is reflected and then we become the face of Jesus Christ. When they see us, people begin to recognize the presence of Christ in our life. So in the same line, Paul is now talking about the jars of clay containing this amazing priceless treasure. In 1964, when the American presidential election was going on, there was a rumor a, a billionaire wanted Billy Graham to run for the presidency. And, but later, of course, Graham declined it. And uh, when Johnson became the president, and uh, he also wanted Graham to succeed him after his term finishes. And uh, even that didn't work out, and finally they wanted to make him an ambassador to Israel. In all these occasions, what Graham says, according to David Aikman's biography, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's much more glorious than holding any government offices. Even if it is to be the office of the greatest nation on earth, to be an evangelist is still much more glorious. Though the office of the president or the cabinet or the ambassador is important, but the privilege of preaching the gospel is indeed a glorious privilege and honor. And this privilege of preaching the gospel is not limited to Billy Graham. It is not limited to those who call themselves called into ministry. It is not limited to those who have gone through seminary training and ordination or some kind of a professional training. This privilege is given to every single child of the living God who has found salvation under the foot of the cross. This is an awesome responsibility given to those who call upon the name of the Lord, who are filled with the knowledge of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether you accept it or not, in your hand we have been given this, this responsibility of preaching the gospel. So today, what Paul is asking us to recognize, I think, is that even though this is an awesome responsibility, even though it is glorious then to be the president of the greatest nation on earth, the amazing thing is, these vessels are clay pots. We are earthen vessels. We are clay pots, jars of clay. So he wants us to, I think, recognize the fragile nature, the valueless nature of this pottery. Uh, if you have read and uh, gone into the Middle East or Asia, you still know that the clay pot or jars of clay were the most commonly used things 
in home, especially if you are belonging to the poorer community. Even today, when you go to India, in the villages, you will hardly find metal utensils. Most of the things, like they carry water from distant places on clay pots. Even they cook food on clay pots. They store grains in clay, jars of clay. They built houses with clay. So these were utensils used by the poor people, not by the rich and the famous. Even in olden time, bronze or brass or copper would be the sign of wealth. Silver, gold, those would be the valuable things. And even in hiding the treasures, in the olden time, if you were rich and the famous, you would make either copper or bronze jars to hide those treasures. And some would finally use the clay because the clay would actually outlast even some of these metals. And the clay pots are so weak. They can be easily broken. They can be easily cracked. They are not so majestic as the China price is too expensive these days. Now, when you say jars of clay, you may be thinking some kind of vase, that million dollar vase. There was a, a man in America about a month ago. He broke many millions worth of China because nobody was paying attention to them. He got so mad, he tried to ask government help for um, making an exhibition or something. Nobody paid it, and so he took a baseball bat and broke them all. Many million, about two, three million worth. He destroyed in a fit of anger. <coughs> that, that fragile. Even though we have decorative value today, but in the olden time, this was a, a everyday a useful utensil, and uh, they didn't care if someone stole it. You go to the villages in India, these clay pots or jars of clay would be left in the yard. Wherever they are, they're just there. But they will not leave the metal utensils, but they will be valuable. They'll, someone will come and steal. And uh, they could just break it away and throw it away when it is not used. They could make it again. Paul is using that this glorious gospel is stored in these clay pots, these jars of clay. Let me then read before I go into some of the things I would like to share with you. Let us read chapter 4, verse 7 to 18. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crossed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live uh, are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord will also raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary or transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing glory or surpassing power 
belongs to God and not to us. Because the, the gospel message is so amazing, so magnificent, so powerful. The gospel transforms human life. The gospel transforms communities. The gospel transforms nations. And then what happens sometime, the power of transformation can be attributed to the vessel, to the preacher. <clears throat> the preacher begins to think, wow, I am great. I could do this. I can have this. And uh, that is why God in His divine wisdom and the Word of God to us today is that these amazing treasures are placed in the earthen vessels so that we will know where the power belongs, where this power of transforming comes from. Even last week, there were two prominent American pastors. Both of them number their church members into 14, 15,000. Both of them sell books in millions. Both of them have their books in New York Times bestseller list. And both of them cracked. Both of them were exposed how they were doing what they were doing, how they were taking credit for themselves. They thought that they can outwin God. They thought that this message that is given to them is maintained because they are so smart, so clever, so that they could manipulate the system in becoming popular. They took popularity as a sign that they have the power to transform the nations. And as a result, they lost their credibility. So we crack many times. In order to show that ultimate power is in the hand of God, not in our hand. So let me first of all talk about the treasure. This treasure that is given to us. Of course, last week we saw that this treasure is the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. Christ himself is the treasure. Just like we read from Job. He, he longs for the intimacy with God. Because in this saga of the struggle between Satan's attempt to discredit Job's credibility, God was hidden for a moment. And Job, realized, with all the relentless attack from his friend, Job began to long for the friendship with God. He knew that his true sense of greatness came because he was a man who feared God. He was great because he had this intimate fellowship with God. In the same way, this treasure today we have is because of the gospel of Jesus. The gospel is given to us. And that is the treasure. But Jesus talks about two kinds of treasures also. Uh, let me read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 to 35. The treasure that you and I have inside our hearts. Two kinds of treasures. It could be implied two kinds of treasure. Here it says... Matthew 12, 34, 35. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person, out of his good treasure, brings forth good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, brings forth evil things. A good person out of his good treasure speaks good. But an evil person out of his evil treasure speaks evil. That is talking about your speech. 
your spoken language, your communication. What do you speak? How do you speak? What kind of communication you engage in at your home, in your family, in your dinner table, in your sofa, with your family, with your children, with your friends? What kind of communication are you engaged with your colleagues at your working environment? Jesus said, out of the good treasure, a person will speak good. In another place, Jesus said, what goes inside the body or from the mouth into the stomach doesn't make you clean or unclean, but what comes out makes you either clean or unclean. And then he said, out of the abundance of the heart, mouth speaks. So if my heart is filled with evil things, evil treasures, then my speech will represent that. And if my heart is filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ, if my heart is filled with the glory of the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that will I speak from my mouth. So that is talking about our speech. If you are filled with the treasure, that is Jesus, the gospel, you will speak it out. <clears throat> In our Monday Bible study, we have an elder who always says, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you become a talkative person. You talk a lot. Anywhere you go, you talk to people about the gospel. <coughs> you cannot keep quiet, because the treasure within you is so precious, so valuable, that you wish everyone would have that. Then the next verse, next kind of approach to this treasure comes from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. Here it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is talking about our conduct. First, Jesus talks about our speech. And now, light, salt, and the lamp talks about our conduct, our behavior, our actions. So how do you preach the gospel? How do you exhibit the glory? By your speech and by your conduct. And your speech and your conduct is conditioned by the kind of treasure you have in your heart. If your heart is filled with the gospel, if your heart is filled with the love of God, if your heart is filled with the things of the kingdom of heaven, then your speech will be affected, your conduct will be affected. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. It will transform you. You do not have to work hard any longer. If you are filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ, you will not need to work hard. The gospel itself will work out the power of God into your hearts and your life. So this is the treasure that Jesus is talking about. That you have Christ in your heart. And your speech is affected. Your behavior, your actions, your conduct is affected. But then he talks about the jars. He said, we have this treasure in jars of clay. If you're a good Christian, if your speech is good, if your conduct is good, wherever you go, you left behind a very powerful positive influence. Many people come to Christ because of you. You have become an exemplary follower of Jesus Christ. You have become the letter. You have become the face of Jesus Christ. You have become the mirror that reflects the glory of God. But that does not validate your flesh. In other words, it does not make you so important. Because 
After all, you and I are jars of clay. You and I are prone to be broken, to be cracked. How much wonderful testimony you may have, but deep in you you know that it is not always the same. You, you struggle oftentimes. Someday you don't want to come to church. Am I the only one to do that? <laughs> Someday you just don't want to read the Bible. Because we are just so clear. We are prone to be cracked or broken. How much you long to live a sinless perfect life in this world, you will fall short. Because this amazing ministry, amazing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is housed in a clay pot. And a clay pot cannot withstand the pressures. It will be broken. How do we know? Just think about yesterday. In the middle of the night, 240 plus student, uh, people thought they are going home or to their destination. They boarded a flight. We don't know what happened to them. We are so weak, so fragile. At any time, life could be snapped out of our hand. In some country, even when you leave your home, you don't know whether you will be able to see back your family or not. Externally, even internally, we struggle because we are clay pot. We are jars of clay made out of the clay. We, the clay pot itself does not have its own power to sustain itself. Neither it has any value or glory. Therefore, he says, the jars of clay, the jars of clay, cannot sustain themselves because number one, he says, we are afflicted in every way. That means this clay pot is subject to all kind of afflictions. Now, the English word affliction generally means some kind of a sickness or <coughs> physical ailment. But the Greek word also implies circumstantial afflictions. And in literally sense, it is between the rock and the hard place, as you say. Between two rocks. You put a clay pot between two rocks, what's going to happen? It's going to cross the clay pot. That's what Paul says. We are the clay pots and we are subject to be crushed by the pressures of this life. And then he says, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed. There are physical sickness, circumstantial afflictions, and then their intention is to crush us. Now you talk about Paul's crossings, his physical sickness, his circumstantial afflictions. And you, he, he could go on and on. He'll go on and on in later chapters. But all I want you to focus today, this clay pot is unable to sustain itself. And therefore it is futile to trust on yourself. Even God is using you mightily. That's not because you're so smart. That's because the gospel of the grace of God is using you. And we need to humble ourselves and say, Lord, I am a broken. I am prone to be afflicted. My body can give up at any time. My circumstances will come so hard at me that they can crush me. But if I survived, that is because of the grace of God. That is because the power belongs to God, not to me. I am crushed between the two rocks. A clay pot is placed between the rocks. And if I don't crack, it's because of the treasure, not because of the clay pot. Secondly, he said, we are perplexed, but not given to despair. It is mental affliction, mental trauma, pressures of life. And the literal word would be, we don't know which way to turn, this way or that way. 
haven't you come in like that situation? You don't know what to do. Did, shall I go this way or shall I go that way? Perplexed, confused, lost, no direction. And he says, we do not despair. Even though I don't know which way to go, but I do not despair because the treasure within me is all that I need. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Christ himself is enough for me. Even I don't know which way to go. If I have to remain where I am, if I have to be in the same condition for the rest of my life, I am okay because I do not despair. That's because the, the, the treasure within me is so precious, so valuable. And the power that sustains me is because of His grace and mercy. He sustains me, not I. And that's why He said in Philippians 4, 6, 7, Don't be anxious, but offer all that you request to God. Then the peace of God that surpasses all our understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. He will give you a peace that even though you don't know which way to go, you will still be at rest. You will be filled with the assurance of God's presence with you. He said, we are perplexed but not in despair. We don't lose hope. Thirdly, he said, persecuted. That is a social affliction. Physical, mental, social, or political. Persecution for preaching the gospel. Persecution for believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Persecution for the things of God. And he said, but we are not forsaken. Persecuted, not forsaken. We have the divine presence of God with us. That's when Jesus said, when they take you before the court, when they make you to stand before the magistrate, don't worry what to say at that time because the Holy Spirit will give you words to speak. When you're persecuted, when you're suffering for Christ's sake, the presence of God will come there. And then if you succeed, if you come out of that suffering, even if you go through that suffering, that will be because of the power of God, not because you are so powerful. If you can endure persecution, that is the sign that the power of God is working in your life. Now, sometimes when we see Christians being daily killed in Islamic nations, from here it looks very terrifying. To have your children kidnapped and killed, to have your father shot at uh, uh, when he was driving or coming home, to be brutally tortured, it is not, we are talk, no, no, not talking about ancient Roman persecution. We are daily happening, even in India. <laughs> and uh, people are able to go through that kind of suffering, not because they are so powerful, because the power of God gives them the divine strength to face these trials in life. That's what Paul says. This jars of clay can give up at any time. We can be afflicted physically, we can be afflicted mentally, we can be afflicted socially and politically. And then he says, struck down, but not destroyed. Struck, physical attack by the enemy. Now you imagine Jesus was struck on face. Paul was struck. He was stoned to death. At one time they thought he was dead, so left him outside of the city. Yet he survived. He said, not destroyed. This clay pot is prone to these kind of afflictions. Even though you're all right with Christ within yourself, you have an impeccable relationship with Christ, but externally you can fall apart. Yet if you survive, if you're not broken, if you're not crossed, if you're not in despair, that is because the power comes from God, not from you. So the treasure that you have is Jesus himself and the clay pot are carrying this treasure. They are housing this treasure. And because the treasure is so valuable, even if you face physical affliction, God will not abandon you until your duty is done. Even if you are perplexed in life, God will not abandon you until his purpose is done. 
even when you are persecuted, God will not let you be destroyed until your, your mission is accomplished. Even when you are struck down and thought to be destroyed, God will not let you go to the grave until you fulfill your mission. Because the thing that sustains us is His power, His grace, His energy. Amen? We don't have to sustain ourselves. That's a great relief. Don't you think, if you have to work hard in maintaining this treasure by your own strength, it will be a terrible life. But we can depend on God, knowing that if I survive, not because I worked hard, but because of His everlasting love giving me that ability. Look at what Paul says in, in chapter 12 of the same book, chapter, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 to 10. He says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, maybe his physical affliction, or anything else that was bothering him, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. <coughs> Self-confidence is a terrible thing for a Christian to have. Self-confidence alienates you from the power of God. The moment I have self-confidence, I deprive myself from the power of God. Now, the world says, you must have self-confidence, you must have self-esteem. And most of the pastors today, those mega church or the popular preachers today, they want to increase your self-esteem, your self-confidence. They want to tell you how to live in this world by having a positive mental frame of mind, which are all good, but that they are not good enough. They have limits. They cannot maintain the breakability of your clay pots. They will break. I had a very good friend of mine, a good minister that I had a good working relationship with him about 12 years ago in Korea. But one thing always bothered me was his self-confidence. He always talked about, I did this. I did this. I started this church from maybe a handful of members and by that time he had 7,000 members. I did it. I did it. Only a few months ago did I realize that he had come to a place of humility. God had brought him to a place of humility that he would have not, never liked to be in. Even though he is back to the same church, but now that about 10, 15,000 members go on to 3,000. And now he knows the value of recognizing that self-confidence is not the solution. Christ confidence. Confidence in the treasure that you have, not in the clay pots. So Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because in my weakness, I see the power of God working in a miraculous way. In my weakness and afflictions and hardships and suffering and pain and sorrow, I see the supernatural power of God carrying me along, giving me the ability and doing the things that I could have never imagined that I could do in my own strength. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, your clay pot can crack any time. You can be broken at any time. If you're trusting on yourself, you will be totally disappointed. But if you trust in Christ and Christ alone, Christ confidence. Jesus said, you can do nothing apart from me. Nothing. Only with me you can do what I have called you to do. So, quickly let me finish this chapter by saying, because our clay pots are maintained by the power of God, we know that the power that works in us is not our own power, it is the power of God. Therefore, now we can embrace death for others' life. Listen to his words again. 
He says, verse 10 onward, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us. Life is at work in you. What Paul is telling is that we know where the power belongs and therefore we can embrace death so that you may have life. In other words, this treasure that is given to us, we were willing to die so that you also can have that treasure. The death is working. We carry the death of Jesus, the marks of Jesus in our body, the stripes of Jesus are bearing in our bodies so that life of Jesus may come to you. For your sake, I am willing to die. That's what Paul meant. For us today, preaching the gospel always has a price to pay. If you're not willing to pay the price, you cannot preach the gospel. In any context, if you want to preach the gospel, if you want to live for the gospel of God, you will have to pay the price. And you think about people dying. You think about the first missionary who wanted to come to Korea. He died before even he even landed in Korea properly. Then you think about many other missionaries who went and they died. They were killed. They did not go to die, actually. They went there to give life to those people. And yet they paid the price by their own life. They were willing to die and therefore today Korea can have church. There are many other nations when people came. Thomas came to India and he was killed and therefore we have a church in India for a 2,000 years. Paul was willing to die for the gospel. Therefore the whole Roman world knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. They did not go there to die. They went there to give life even though they had to pay the price. That's what it means. Preaching the gospel requires sacrifices. And a true disciple of Jesus Christ cannot simply consume the love of God. He or she will be consumed by the love of God. You know, we have a consumerist society. We want to consume the love of God. We want to have the love of God. We want to have the blessings. We want to, we want to receive everything from God. We want to receive... The blessings, life, health, prosperity, and so many other things. But the genuine disciple of Jesus Christ will be consumed by the love of God. And in such a way that he or she will not be able to keep quiet. They will be willing to pay the price to share the gospel. And you know, nothing excites, excites a person if you have come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I have many friends that I am... Um, privileged to have association and some of them are retiring and I can see the confusion what next what to do how should I leave but for those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ there is no retiring you never complete and retire if you retire you retire into the kingdom of heaven amen a true disciple of Jesus Christ will not simply receive and receive and receive. They would like to give. Give their life, give their love, give their valuables, give everything if they can, like Zacchaeus did it. They will be consumed by the love of God and they will not care even if they die. So therefore we can give our life so that others can have life because this treasure is so valuable to give to myself. Secondly, how can you die? How can you embrace death? How could you embrace death? Let me read again. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed by day and by day by day. But the light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We look not to the things that are sin, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are sin are temporary, 
but the things that are unseen are eternal. First, we can embrace death because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is a resurrection coming. We will one day be transformed. Together we will rise in the kingdom of heaven. There is a resurrection day coming. We, even though we are killed in the shores of Korea, or killed in North Korea, or killed in Iraq, or killed in Afghanistan, or killed in Africa, or, or anywhere in the world, we may be killed in our physical condition. Our jars of clay may be broken everywhere, but the fact of the matter is, just as Jesus rose from the dead, we will also one day rise again. The resurrection should never go out of our picture, brothers and sisters, out of our sight. And then secondly, he said, we are being renewed inwardly, day by day. Yes, outwardly we are wasting away. We are getting old. If, if nobody attacks you also, if no persecution comes to you, no sickness comes to you, wait until you become 90 years old. Outwardly, we are wasting away. But inwardly, we are being renewed every single day. Do you have that experience? Do you feel the renewing power of the Holy Spirit every single day? The reason you can embrace death in the physical surrounding is because in your spirituality, you are becoming renewed every single day. The Holy Spirit is working within you in such a way, giving you new life every single moment of your day. The internal renewing is a constant process. That is what we call sometimes revival. But we wait for 100 years for the revival to come. No, the Bible doesn't know that kind of... It is a daily revival, daily restoration, daily renewing of the power, by the power of the Holy Spirit, our inward life, better than yesterday and better than today. C.S. Lewis talks about the heavenly existence and he says, yesterday, in heaven it's going to be like, yesterday was joyful, but today even more. Today is wonderful, but tomorrow is going to be even greater than today. It is ever-increasing joy that you will never feel boring in heaven. In the same way, in your physical existence here in this world, as a spiritual believer, you must have this ever-increasing newness of life in your heart and your mind. Otherwise, you will be tired. You will go into depression. You will be a miserable Christian. Every time you stop experiencing renewing power of the Holy Spirit, you become tired Christian. You lose zeal and vitality. That is what in, in a, uh, the book of Revelation, Jesus said, you have lost your first love. Do you experience this inner renewing power of the Holy Spirit? Paul says, we are being wasted outside, outwardly, but inwardly. We are being renewed. And then he said, our suffering here will result in glory. The weight of glory, eternal glory. Whatever you suffer, whatever you sacrifice, it will not go in vain. No matter what you suffer for the sake of Christ, no matter what you sacrifice, how much you sacrifice, the Bible says he will Keep it. So much so, even your single tear will be recorded. The tears you shed for others, the tears that you pray for others with, the, the suffering that you go through, even Jesus goes to so far to, if you give a cold cup of water to someone in my name, because they are my disciples, you would not lose your reward. So Paul says, we don't care how much we suffer in this life because we have an eternity coming. And in eternity, our temporary suffering is affecting our eternal glory. So I don't care in this world how much we suffer because he gives us the ability to strengthen. He strengthens us. He gives us the power to suffer. So I don't encourage you to invite suffering in your life. Don't look for suffering. That will be wrong. But when suffering comes, don't be afraid. 
don't panic. But know that he has the power to sustain you through suffering. And through that suffering you go and you will inherit the weight of eternal glory. And then he says, the reason we can embrace suffering is because we see the things that are invisible. We see the things that are beyond our natural comprehension. We are all limited here by our natural sur our surroundings, but because we focus on the things of the kingdom of heaven, the eternal things. And therefore we can embrace all kind of suffering. Let me read the last verse and then I close about seeing the invisible. Because if, if you are only looking at the visible, you are going to be discouraged. If you don't see any natural progress in your life, if you, don't, if you cannot quantify your natural assets or, or, or physical wealth or success, you cannot measure, you will be discouraged. Look at what Moses said. Moses did according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24 to 27. Here it says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. <coughs> Hebrew 11, 24 to 27. What it says, he refused to engage or indulge the pleasures, the treasures of Egypt, the pleasures of sin. He was not afraid of the fear of king. He was not afraid to be killed because he saw what was and who was invisible, that is God. He believed in God. He looked for the glory of God. And therefore he was able to leave Egypt by faith. <coughs> focusing on what is invisible. So shall we close our eyes and think about our personal surroundings. Are we housing the treasures of God? Are we filled with the treasures of God? What is the condition of our play pots? Are we afraid of afflictions, confusions, persecutions, and then personal attacks? Even then, He will demonstrate His power in our life. He will give us the strength to carry on. And as because of the grace and the mercy of God are there, and the treasures is in our hearts, we will be able to speak because our hearts are filled with the gospel. We will be able to live, our right conduct will be there because the treasure conditions are living. Because the treasure is given to us, because the jars of clay are maintained by the power of God, we can embrace death so that others can live. We can go and preach the gospel, willing to pay the price. And we can embrace death because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because we are being renewed by the power of God inwardly every single day because the, the momentary suffering is producing the eternal weight of glory for us and also because we focus on the things unseen not the things that are here not the temporary things your wealth your education your popularity your beauty your power all are temporary they are going to be destroyed they are going to be burnt up but your love your faith your hope in God will remain for eternity and that's what Moses did he could live Egypt he could live the pleasures of sin treasures of Egypt he could face the wrath of Pharaoh he could face the unknown future because he saw the invisible. Let us focus on Christ and Christ alone. Shall we all stand as the worship team sings?